man, Deanna, Deanna's my sister, so um, great to have her, and my wonderful brother-in-law, Matt. Um, 25 years ago, they left for Seattle, Washington to per pursue their careers and their education, and they started volunteering at a farm called Jubilee Farm. I think they did a work share or something where they worked at the farm and they got vegetables. Um, and then over the years, they really enjoyed it. They got more and more involved. And then one year they purchased the property and the house next to the farm and they started farming themselves. So, um, and they've done that all those years living in the Washington area. Now they're back in Michigan. So. Um, just um, you know, today, Dee's a nurse practitioner. She also has a degree in nutrition. You know, Matt did a lot with the farm. He also has a YouTube channel he'll probably tell you more about uh, with gardening tips. And so they just have a career, a wealth of knowledge that, you know, they have, ex have gained over the years and they're, they're nice enough to share it with us tonight. So we appreciate them taking the time to <clears throat> To present for us, and I'll let them take it from here. All right, thank yeah, you thanks, so Tom. much, Tom. We and appreciate Olivia. that. Um, uh, like they said, uh, we had lived in Washington for uh, quite a few years and had our own farm there. And now, since we moved back to Michigan, we are, you know, starting a uh, gardening. Um, and it's been a little bit of a change to go from growing food for hundreds of people to just ourselves and family, but we find it still quite enjoyable. So. The way I kind of set up this talk is I am going to talk of maybe the first 10 or 15 minutes on some of the benefits of gardening, um, some of the uh, physical benefits and mental benefits. And then Matt is going to talk about actually how to start um, a garden. So let me just get to my slides here. <clears throat> So just some of the objectives for today, we're gonna to identify some of the physical and mental health benefits of gardening, uh, discuss some of the environmental benefits of gardening. Uh, Matt's gonna talk about a good location and size for your garden, which vegetables to grow, how to prepare your soil and determining when you should harvest. So just getting into the uh, physical and mental benefits of gardening, the CDC defines moderate exercise as two and a half hours a week. And gardening is a great way to get this exercise. Um, it's associated with weight loss of 300 calories an hour. It increases your muscle strength. And if you think about the things you do when you're out gardening, walking, bending, lifting, pulling, all these movements happen out in the garden. And these can fit into your uh, daily exercise routine. So if we think about some of these things, when you're walking, it helps to increase your immune function. When you're bending, of course, it helps increase your flexibility. When you're lifting things, it can help increase your muscle strength. Same with pulling. It can not only help increase muscle strength, but also helps in weight loss. And then of course, sunlight. And you're mostly outside in the garden when it's daylight. And so you're just absorbing a lot of vitamin D. And that's really the only way to get your vitamin D levels up. You really need that sunlight. <clears throat> Some other things that you can get from gardening um, our happiness. And maybe some of you have talked to people who have a garden and Tom had mentioned it a little bit before um, in his introduction that he just finds it so nice to be out in the garden. And people will say, that's my happy place. Well, there might be actually some scientific evidence to that. There is a bacterium that's found in soil, which can actually make you feel more relaxed and happier. And this bacteria, when you are digging in the soil and turning it over, it activates the neurons in your brain that can release serotonin. And serotonin in your brain is what is similar when people take antidepressants. The whole idea behind these antidepressants is to help release more serotonin. So by turning over soil and getting your hands in the dirt, you can actually find this happiness and some of it could be related to this bacterium that, that is in the soil. And when you start to release more serotonin in your brain, people will find that their quality of life improves, they get ha more happy, uh, stress relief, and other things that you can find when you're gardening is concentration. Um, there's been multiple studies that show that um, gardening can help children by reducing ADHD symptoms and um, 
when schools have put together a gardening program that kids find that they eat not only eat more vegetables because they're actually part of the growing and uh, harvesting of the vegetables, but they also uh, have better concentration. And lastly, community. Um, there has been multiple studies on uh, community and gardening and uh, how people can get more connected by gardening. So even if you don't have your own area to garden, some people will do like a pea patch or they'll garden with their neighbor. And there's been studies that show that daily gardening can reduce dementia by up to 36%. So it's really a great way uh, for older people to, to get out and get some activity. Um, also help their brains and be more part of a community. Now, because of my background as a nurse practitioner, I work in cardiovascular disease and I talk to my patients on a regular basis about diet and exercise and how to stay healthy from a cardiovascular standpoint. And the diet that we most recommend is called the Mediterranean diet, which some of you may have heard of. Um, it's the most researched diet for cardiovascular health. And one study that was published back in 2018 looked at people at a high, that were at high risk for cardiovascular disease over a five-year period. And they put these people into to two separate groups. One followed the Mediterranean diet and the other followed just a general low-fat diet. And what they found was the group in the Mediterranean diet had a 30% lower relative risk of heart attacks or stroke compared to the low-fat diet group. And if you think about the Mediterranean diet, um, there's a little uh, picture here on the side, the physical act inactivity uh, and being with family is the basis of this diet, which is really nice. And then it's whole grains, legumes, fruits, and vegetables. These are the mainstays of the diet. And going up, you eat less of these foods, but they're still important. Um, fish, especially salmon, you get a lot of omega-3s from that. Um, poultry, eggs, or dairy, and then very limited red meat and sweets. So this diet has been shown to be very good for cardiovascular health until more recently, uh, newer re research came out in the last couple of years that showed something called the green Mediterranean diet. And the green Mediterranean diet included more plant-based foods and less meat than the traditional Mediterranean diet. And when they compared both of these diets together, they found that people who followed the green Mediterranean diet with the increased plant-based foods had lower blood pressure, uh, they reduced their insulin resistance, so it helped with diabetes, and it decreased the fat around your visceral fat, which is what the fat is around mostly around your belly. And this is, the, um, this is a very strong indicator of cardiovascular disease. So we do know that people who grow their own food tend to eat more fresh produce. And so that's a cornerstone of both of these diets, but mostly the green Mediterranean diet, which um, I've been recommending a lot to my patients lately. Now, if we look at just the very basics of, um, you know, um, the benefits of gardening, just think about the basic science of it. Plants can take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they produce oxygen as a byproduct of photosynthesis, which some of us might remember from our science days back in high school. But through this process, uh, the plants will absorb any chemicals, bacteria, or harmful elements in the air. And then they filter all of this into a useful waste, uh, useful waste products like water and oxygen. And plant roots also can help take up some chemicals and heavy metals in the soil. So even on a very basic scientific level, um, plants do a lot for our environment by keeping the air clean. Uh, also, when you're thinking about planting your own garden, if you think about um, going to the grocery store and buying produce, um, most of the time it comes in plastic packaging. So if you are planting your own food, uh, you can reduce the amount of plastic packaging that you're using, which of course will also reduce the amount of uh, fossil fuel inputs. Um, it helps create habitat for animals. Um, you know, we like to plant a lot of flowers within our garden and around our property. It helps bring in uh, butterflies and uh, any insects for pollination, which is really good for the area in your garden. Uh, compost, 30% um, of landfills are filled with scraps and yard waste, which just piles up into uh, the garbage dumps, which of course emits methane. And we know that methane is a harmful greenhouse gas. So if you are starting your own garden and you have an area that you can compost, you can help um, reduce some of that. Um, and then finally, reducing chemical inputs. 
So most of the time when you have a home garden, you're not going to be spraying things on your crops. We have some tricks that we will talk about either this uh, presentation or Matt can talk about throughout the year on his gardening presentations um, that there are a way to keep pests off of your garden without using a lot of chemical inputs. Now there are some certified organic um, inputs that we do sometimes use, um, but overall you are going to be reducing the amount of that if you're growing your own food. And then I want to talk a little bit about just reducing greenhouse emissions. So this um, table here just shows how much greenhouse is emitted by the foods that we're eating. And you can see the very highest one is beef. And then as you look down, as you get into nuts, potatoes, uh, bananas, more of the uh, fruits and vegetables and nuts, you can see that those are much less in emitting greenhouse uh, emissions. And there was a recent study uh, by Oxford University that just came out about a year ago, and they suggest that just a global switch to plant-based diets could halt greenhouse gases for up to three decades. Um, and this is mostly due to the fact that livestock farming is a major source of methane. Um, and this is a greenhouse gas that is, that is much more powerful than just carbon dioxide. So researchers have found that um, an individual carbon footprint can be reduced by 73% just by switching to a, more of a plant-based diet. So this, um, by sh uh, this little um, picture here just shows the annual metric tons of emissions on an average diet. And look how much we can reduce that just by switching to a plant-based diet. And even if you eat less meat, which sometimes when um, I'm counseling people on switching over to a plant-based diet, I really talked to them initially just about cutting out meat for maybe one meal a day and then trying to have them do that for one day a week and then increasing that throughout the week. So even if you can decrease the amount of meat you're eating and try and get some locally sourced food, which could be from your own garden, you can really reduce the carbon footprint um, that we're creating. And then um, Matt is going to kind of take over and talk a little bit now about actually starting a garden. And, you know, everyone kind of has different ways of where they live, what their situation is. And it doesn't have to be really complicated just to start growing one thing or two things. So um, we'll kind of go through that a little bit and, and show you how you can just grow a couple things, uh, maybe even this year, just to get yourself started. All right, everyone. So uh, as you can see by the slide, the main ingredient for your garden is gonna be the location, the location and the location. And uh, obviously you wanna pick a, an area where you have the uh, access to the most sunlight, uh, which is generally gonna be, you know, something South facing, Southeast, Southwest. Uh, you don't wanna put it somewhere on the North side of a building, obviously where you have a shaded, uh, highly shaded area. Although that can be good for certain, certain cr uh, crops and vegetables. For the most part, you wanna be in an open area. You want to make sure that obviously you have some type of water source, so you're near a water spigot, or you have a way to get, um, you know, water, a watering canister or something to your vegetables. Uh, you'll find that oftentimes in Michigan we are blessed with some uh, perfect rainfall that happens at just the right time, but that doesn't always happen. So you want to make sure that you have uh, some type of water source for sure. Uh, you want to make sure that it's convenient for you. So for most people are starting gardens, and Tom had mentioned earlier that they have. Uh, a little garden area behind their house and they live in Farmington Hills. So they're in a uh, subdivision and uh, it's right, right in the backyard, right behind their house, really easy to get to. And this is kind of the thing that you'd want to think about as well. So it could be something as small as just a, a, a big a, a bucket or a bin, just a small container. Uh, you could do, uh, you know, large pots uh, around an area, or you could even do raised beds or things of that nature. And, you know, raised beds don't have to be that big. I mean, you can, uh, you can use kind of the dimensions of lumber to make it easy. So you can, you know, start with something that's like a four by eight size uh, and really easy to get to something that you can reach, you know, around easily. Obviously, if it's a raised bed, you don't have to bend over quite as much. Um, you can see in these photos, there's uh, four different options here, and there's many more that are obviously available. People have come up with all kinds of ideas to repurpose things, whether it's pots or uh, containers that maybe you use for something else that you can repurpose as a container to grow food in. Uh, and you can, uh, 
you can actually grow quite a bit in in a, a small amount of, of space. And you can actually see in one of these photos that there's a, a large eggplant growing in, in probably like a 12 or 14 inch pot, a clay pot. So it, it, it doesn't take a very large space to grow uh, food and to get going. And one of the nice things about a smaller area too is that it's easier to water by hand. So it's more convenient. You're gonna have less weeds, especially if you're using uh, you know, you're bringing in compost or you're bringing, uh, you know, soil that you've uh, that you've purchased from your local store, that kind of thing. And you're obviously going to deal with less pests. You know, the smaller the area, you're probably going to be dealing with a little bit less pests than you've had a larger area. So these are kind of all some of the benefits to starting smaller. And I was just going to mention, Matt and I happened to be at Costco the other day. And if you see this bottom picture where the little white um, garden raised bed is it's this company called where Vita and they have a lot of really nice stuff on their website um, that you can get that are you know for raised beds they have some made out of cedar they have some really nice things and they're pretty affordable so even if you want to start something very small like that it would be a really good way to put something in your in your backyard that is easily to move around too yeah and you can see that photo it's really nice it's a grid system I mean this particular one has uh, 16 little spots in it I'm, I'm not sure the size I think they're probably eight or 12 inch grids, I would imagine. And so uh, it kind of gives you a nice visual if that's the type of person you are to kind of, to help you lay out what you want to plant and, and get you going where you can do three or four different things. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing is, you know, selecting which vegetables to grow. And, and just up on the screen, we've got some of the, the basic, easy, easier ones to grow, especially here in Michigan. You know, the nice thing is that once the warm weather here hits and, you know, usually by the, the time you get into that first week of May, the soil has really warmed up and you can make up for lost ground here. Whereas in Washington state, we had to plant stuff really early. We had to plant in greenhouses because we just had a lot, a lot less heat during the summer. So here in Michigan, you have quite a few options, especially once, once, you know, you get into late spring and summer, things like tomatoes, cucumbers, lettuces, uh, zucchini is great. Um, we've all have family members or ourselves who like to go around and with the big basket of zucchini saying, can someone please help me? I've got so much zucchini growing here and it's really a, a great food. I mean, we'll grow, you know, just a couple of zucchini plants for us and we will eat that in the, in the morning for breakfast. We'll um, just saute up some zucchini. Uh, it is just really quick and easy and it's so abundant. It just does not take much. You can grow you know, one uh, uh, yellow summer squash and one green zucchini plant, and that will feed, you know, your family for an entire summer. So um, things to, those are just things to be cognizant of, is just things that are easy for you to grow that don't take a whole lot of, um, you know, space and a, and a whole lot of effort, really. And other things are that if you're just starting out too are herbs, they're always really nice to grow some herbs or easy to grow. You can grow them in little containers and it's a great way to add fresh herbs to your uh, meals. And so, so with uh, starting your own seeds, so one of the things that we do or we do is we start everything by, by, with our own seeds. So we actually will use soil blocks and we will seed all of our soil blocks and grow everything from a seed until we actually transplant it out. Uh, the only thing that we don't actually transplant is our carrots, which we direct seed. Those just don't, those don't uh, transplant very well, but um, everything else we, we will start from seed and we'll, we'll set out ourselves once they are big enough to be uh, set into the garden. Uh, one of the, or some of the benefits are that with that is you get more variety. Uh, sometimes when you go to, you know, a farmer's market or you go to a grocery store, they may have limited varieties, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. They can also have varieties that, uh, you know, are do well in this area. So that's, that's good, but starting your own seeds, you know, you can open up a catalog and pick just about anything you want. Uh, you know, it's less expensive than buying uh, plant starts. So that's one thing that's nice about it. Uh, and then there's the joy of set and satisfaction of actually watching, you know, a tiny little seed that you, you know, plant into the soil yourself actually, you know, bloom into something that, you know, in 30 to 60 to 90 days, you actually is something that's edible and you can eat. There's just um, you know, when you see some of these seeds, if you haven't seen a small brassica seed, so like a kale or broccoli, or even something like um, uh, carrots, just absolutely very tiny seeds. And when you look at those in your hand, it's just amazing to think of what, uh, what those can become. So those are some of the benefits to starting your own seeds. And then some of the, some of the, um, the downside of starting your own seeds are they take more time. 
Um, they also require a little bit more space because you have to have a place to start them uh, when it's a little bit warm, uh, cooler out, um, kind of getting towards spring, but you need a place where you can keep them warm. So they do require a little bit more materials and startup costs. Uh, we use heat mats and we have, you know, a kind of a covered, what is that called? A covered. A, it's like a, a cloche or a we put a little heater in it. So it does take a little bit more time, a little bit more effort if you're going to start your own seeds. Um, and if it's your first time gardening, you might want to just buy, you know, plant starts from your local farmer's market uh, just to get the feel of it. Yeah, it's a, it's a little cold frame. And yeah, you, it, it might be uh, good to do both too. You could do some plants, buy some plant starts and do some of your own seeding just to kind of get a feel for it. So, yeah. uh, and as we, yeah, as we explained, using uh, the plant starts, you know, it's ready for the garden. So you're not waiting for the soil, to, you know, you're not waiting for the seeds to germinate in the soil themselves. So if it's cooler out, you can plant something that's already, you know, a, a plant as opposed to just a seed and it's gonna do a lot better and have a, a little bit better chance to get going in the garden. Uh, a lot less effort to start, a lot less maintenance. Um, it's, you know, uh, you're supporting, some of the things when you're using plant starts too, especially if you buy them from farmer's markets, is you're supporting your local farmers. You can also, uh, start things throughout the year and start them a little later and you don't have to worry about that startup time of you know some some seed varieties take you know two weeks in optimal optimal conditions to even germinate so you eliminate that 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 uh, window there um, obviously some of the limitations like we just uh, previously discussed were you know things like the varieties you may not have access to as many varieties although that may not be as big of an issue because there's still quite a few varieties that are out there and they can obviously be more expensive than seeds. So when you're buying a plant, you know, you may be paying four or $5 for a plant as opposed to, you know, $1. fifty for, you know, 50 seeds. It just depends on the variety though, that it, it may make more sense for you to buy a, a plant start. So some of the materials that you need, if you, if you are going to start seed is obviously you need a germination mix and you'll need some type of a, a bin or bucket to uh, to mix your germination mix. And then you'll need uh, some type of seed trays or paper cups. There's all kinds of things you can find, uh, especially now as I'm out at all the local garden centers or at like Ace Hardware and all those, they've already started to put out gardening supplies. So you can find sections where they've got all this set up for first time gardener, just little kits that will help you get going. Um, things like the tags and, you know, pen obviously to write out your uh, varieties and then obviously you need water so I think uh, right now we've got a little video is that correct yep. yeah we a have little, a little yep. so we're, yep so we've got a little video we did last year of uh, mixing some uh, some of this potting soil and seeing a couple of things we uh, we use uh, soil block makers but uh, we realize that those are they can be cost prohibited and not everyone uh, needs quite that um, that amount of equipment so we did this using some compostable uh, trays and paper cups. I do want to mention with the compostable trays that even though they say they are compostable, we would recommend that you don't actually transplant the entire tray into the garden with your plant. You want to remove your plant because they do take uh, quite a bit of time to break down and your plants can get root bound within the trays themselves. So if you are using compostable trays, I would suggest removing your plants and planting them directly into your soil. So it's a little video. Okay, so what we're doing right now is we're going to um, do a little bit of seeding. And what I've got here is I've got some um, organic potting soil mix. And you could use either a potting soil mix or a uh, seed starting or a germination mix. Um, the main thing is you want to make sure this number on here you see is a low number like this. So 0 0.09, 0 0.03, 0 0.03. The seedling mixes or the germination mixes will be a 0 0.03, 0 0.03, 0 0.03, 0 0.03. And that's just referring to the nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. And so for seedlings, you don't need very much to get them going. So these will help to keep them from burning or getting too much uh, nutrients when they're young. So what we're going to do is you need a some kind of container to mix your um, seedling or potting soil mix in and then just some water, either a hose or a bucket or whatever you have handy. And so we'll start with that. And you're gonna kind of look at how many seedlings you're gonna be planting that day or how many pots you're gonna be filling. 
and just kind of guesstimate how much mix you need. And anything that's left over, you can just leave in your container and just put it in a shaded area and it will, it will last till the next time you use it. So we're gonna put a little bit of water in here. And we're gonna mix this up so that it's wet and it starts to cling together. You want it so that when you pick it up, you can maybe wring just a little bit of water out of it, but not, not anything that's like a faucet. So that's a little too wet. So we're gonna add a little more, a little more mix. Just gonna thoroughly mix it so that all the soil is moist. And it should kind of stay together when you hold it. So something like that. So when I squeeze it, there's still a little bit of water coming out of there, but okay, now we have uh, these compostable potting containers, which you can get from your local hardware store or gardening supply store. And we've also got these small Dixie cups. So both of these are really nice for seed starting. So you grab your container. You're going to just pack your soil in there and you're going to press firm, but you don't want it to be packed so tightly that it's, um, that it's too tight. So you want it so that it's firm, but not so tight that you can't, you know, water's going to beat up out of it and not, not actually soak into it. So there's our soil mix in those and we'll do a Dixie cup, same thing. So it's, it's maybe like, I'd say lightly packed. So maybe like a medium pack, that makes sense. Okay. For the Dixie cup, you can use, I'm just using a drill bit. You can just poke a small hole in the bottom, just something for drainage. And then we're gonna make our little dibbles for our seeds. You can use a pen, you can use your pinky, anything that works for you, we're using a Sharpie. We're just gonna make a little dibble, about a half inch. If you're, uh, Planting bigger seeds like squash or pumpkins, those kind of things, you can make a little bit bigger dibble for something small, like brassicas, like broccoli, that kind of stuff, lettuce, you can make it a little bit smaller, but just in general, about the, the uh, circumference of a Sharpie pen and maybe a half inch into the soil. Next we're gonna take, got some chard here. So normally uh, we would just put one seed in each cell, but if you have a, you know, a small amount that you're doing, so like in this case, we're doing four, it's okay to do two seeds in each cell. That way, if one doesn't germinate, you make sure that you, you know, have all your cells that will germinate and you can thin them out later. So we're gonna go two seeds in each hole. Just drop them in there. And then on the Dixie cup, let's do a uh, summer squash or a zucchini. And these are a bigger, a bigger seed. And it doesn't matter with these kind of seeds, how you put them in there, they're gonna grow no matter what. So it doesn't matter if you put them in sideways, pointed up, pointed down. So I'm just gonna put it in there, just kind of lightly press it in there. So you can see it's about a half inch below the, the top of the soil line. And I'm just gonna gently fill it over there and kind of give it a light pack. And we're going to do the same thing with these. I'm just going to gently push the soil over and around the hole or the dibble and give it a light pack. 
And then uh, if you want, you can get little markers from uh, the little tags from any home, you know, supply store or any uh, hardware store, uh, anything like that, farmer supply store. You can write down what you have planted and you're gonna stick it in there. And that's all you have to do to seed your plants. That's it, it's that easy. <laughs> All right. Okay, so just really quickly, if you're doing a container, or anything, whether it's a, a, a raised bed or even a small container, like I mentioned, these are kind of the key components you need is some type of soil mix. And we just have a couple listed here that are ready avail readily available, but I would suggest if you have, you know, whatever your local hardware store is or like a garden center, you can always talk to someone there and they can recommend something, but you'll want some type of a, uh, you know, a vegetable garden mix, obviously, or a raised bed soil, some type of all-purpose soil. You'll need some, some type of compost to mix in there. And in general, it's, you know, a 60-30 or 60-40, kind of a 60-30-10, but for this purpose, if you're just doing a soil mix and compost, it's, you know, 60% to 70% soil mix to 60% to 30%, or I'm sorry, 40% to 30% of your compost, just kind of depends. Uh, what you want to do in your area, but th that type of a, a uh, ratio. And then obviously some type of a, a fertilizer and there's a myriad of fertilizers out there. You just want something that is specific to, you know, growing vegetables, fruits and vegetables. Because uh, there is a difference if you're growing flowers, flowers uh, tend to need more phosphorus uh, because they by nature flower and flowers will take up phosphorus. Whereas food that we're normally growing uh, to, to eat, you kind of think of things that are, are more green. Those are fruits, uh, vegetables, things that need uh, more um, nitrogen. So that's why you want to uh, steer towards something that is specifically formulated for vegetables. And then for the, to figure out how much soil you need, you just uh, figure out your cubic feet. So the width times your length times the height of your container or uh, a cubic, uh, just do a cubic feet calculator on the internet. If you just search that, you can, if you Google that, one will come up and you can just put in your dimension and it will tell you how much you need. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, I think you talked about that yeah. already. And then when you're, so th this picture of seedlings is kind of a good rep representation. Those look like uh, beans to me. And so Generally speaking, it, it depends on, on what you're growing. Certain things take a little longer. Uh, things like kale, lettuce, those, those come up pretty quickly. Uh, even like summer squash, zucchini grows pretty quickly. So just a, a, you know, in general, three to four weeks after seeding or when things are two to three inches high, uh, you know, that type of stuff you can plant. Tomatoes, peppers, those kind of things, you wait till maybe they're you know, closer to you know, eight to 12 inches tall. Uh, but most things you look at will have some type of directions and things to follow on the actual seed packet itself to give you some kind of hints as to, to when, what's the optimal time to put stuff out. You wanna make sure that you're obviously watering the seedlings well, uh, especially if it's warm out. I mean, I'll, I'll water multiple times. Uh, you cannot overwater these. If, as long as the water can drain, you will not overwater your seedlings. Uh, if they are in a, uh, some type of container where they, aren't allowed to dry it to, uh, to um, drain, that's where you do run into problems. But for the most part, you just wanna make sure that you keep your, your uh, soil moist. And then uh, you wanna add a small handful of fertilizer each time that you're planting something. So as you can see on this picture where that hole is, you would add whatever is the recommended amount of fertilizer per the package. So it'll tell you, you know, usually it'll say per square footage, how much you, know, you wanna put in there. So Again, if you're using something that is specifically designed for vegetables, you'd have to really, really over fertilize to do damage. So as long as you're following the instructions, it's, it's, it's fairly safe. So, and then um, obviously uh, for most, in, in general, for most plants, you're going to uh, place the seedling into the, or the plug into the hole and cover it up to the kind of the bottom of the, the stem of the, or the, you know, where the stem meets the soil and uh, just make sure that you tap it down a little bit and just water it again. And you know, you'll be amazed the stuff you put it in the ground and it will grow. Yeah, and most of the time, if you're not gonna start your own seeds, but you're gonna um, buy uh, starts from the farmer's market or the store, wherever you're gonna get them, 
Uh, usually when you get those, most of those are probably pretty close to being able to be transplanted. They, I think they usually sell them that way. But if you go to a farmer's market, I definitely ask the farmer to, you know, let them, you know, let them tell you if they're ready to be transplanted into the ground or not. Um, it will also depend on, you know, the, you know, kind of like if there's going to be any more freeze or anything like that. But I think at, in Michigan, once it's past what? June. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, you can, can get, much. yeah, you can get a freeze here, obviously, up until I think the frost dates now is somewhere around the middle of April. But I mean, once, once May hits, you're pretty, pretty you're pretty safe. safe. I mean, yeah. it, it, things, something certainly uh, the ordinary could happen. But uh, the next thing is uh, one of the biggest things that, that we always used to get questions about, especially when we had our own farm, was just, you know, when, when do I know uh, when things are ready and when to harvest them? And there's obviously a lot of different fruits and vegetables out there. So probably it's going to be one of those things where obviously if you're growing a red tomato and the tomato is red, it's time to harvest it. Uh, you know, it, you can look at seed packages. You can look at, uh, there's plenty of pictures online and things like that where you can get an idea of when something's ready to harvest. You know, things like lettuce, uh, spinach, like greens, uh, you know, um, uh, Mizuna, Tatsoi, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you can really, you know, the, the, you, obviously people have probably heard of microgreens. So those things, even when they're uh, at the transplant stage and when they're just tiny, when you're actually going to transplant them out in the garden, those are all edible. You know, obviously you're not going to get, uh, you know, as much um, volume out of it at that size. But so, so things like lettuce, there really isn't a wrong time to harvest it. You just want to make sure things like that you get before they, they want to go to seed or flower things like that. But for most things, it's good to just look at the package and kind of get an idea of when the maturity date is. So almost every seed package will have a maturity date. And that's usually, usually telling you from the time you transplant it, how many days until the time it's ready to harvest. Obviously, there's environmental factors. So it's one of those things where you're going to just have to kind of learn as you go. And, you know, it's trial, trial and error until you kind of figure out like, oh, okay, this is this is ready to go now. And I would just say, you know, if you're first starting to grow things, the single harvest crop sometimes can be a little more challenging because if nothing comes up, then, you know, you don't get anything. Um, let these, um, aside from lettuce, lettuce is usually pretty safe, but growing like cucumbers, little cherry tomatoes, or the summer squash, those are usually really good. And you, you know, they just keep growing all, you know, for at least a couple months. So those are really nice crops to grow these reoccurring crops, I think, when you're just starting out. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically in conclusion, um, you know, there's a lot of benefits to gardening. Again, I think, you know, for me and for most of you who are working, you know, I work in an office, I work with a, you know, a lot of fake light and, you know, it's a really nice thing to come home in the summer and be outside getting my hands in the dirt. You know, there's a real connection to the earth and connection to, uh, you know, your food when you're growing your own food and, it's a really nice time to just be, have quiet, you know, people are on screens all the time, you know, it's just the environment we live in right now. So I would really encourage you, even if you're doing something small, you'd, you'd be amazed at the benefits you get just from going out to your patio or to your deck or to your backyard and just um, putting some seeds in the ground and watching them grow for the summer and being able to go out there and harvest that that food um, in a couple months. It's, it's just a really great feeling. And um, we, VegMish has also started a, a kind of a cooking video that I started doing monthly. And throughout the year, I'm gonna be showing videos that uh, incorporate some of the foods that we grow in our garden, maybe things you can get at a local farmer's market. Uh, not everything is seasonal that we eat, but we do try to eat that way in the summer as much as we can. So we will be showing you some recipes like that throughout the year. Um, and then Matt, do you want to talk about some gardening stuff too for your videos? Oh yeah. So I, I actually have started a YouTube channel that's called The Loopy Gardener. And I'll be doing, uh, I started it late last year and have some, some videos up, but basically I'll be walking everyone through and uh, doing short videos from seeding all the way through planting, harvesting. And then as Deanna mentioned, bringing some of those things that we're growing in the garden into the kitchen and actually preparing them and, and doing some quick and easy dishes and things like that. So uh, it's one of the things I noticed was kind of lacking, especially with YouTube gardening channels is actually working through the season you know, rather than just putting up a video here, they're actually saying, okay, you know, today we're going to be seeding onions and it's this time of year in Michigan to be doing that. So I'm going to try and keep some type of schedule to help folks know kind of within a week window of, you know, now's a good time to plant 
you know, this vegetable or this fruit and, and so on. And then we can kind of show you throughout the year, like what things should be looking like, you know, this is what we look for if there's pl uh, problems with the plants or um, if they're getting pest issues. And then when we think it's ready to harvest, so you'll kind of be gardening along with us if that's, um, if that's something you're interested in. Um, so that's all we have. So hopefully you guys are inspired a little bit to start small and have some fun in your garden this year. And we'll be having, you know, we'll be around if you, if you want to follow along with us to, to make it easier for you. All right. Thanks so much for that wonderful presentation. Very informative. As Deanna mentioned, we're doing a monthly segment. Um, this month, Deanna did a, a um, quinoa salad. So check that out on our um, YouTube channel. Uh, it's a six minute video about uh, a little spin on a quinoa salad. It's very delicious. It's packed with nutrients. Um, so check that out on our YouTube channel. And every month in our newsletter, there'll be a new recipe. The whole idea of some of these uh, cooking demonstrations that I'm doing, I really want it to be easy for people. And you'll see that a lot of times there is no specific plan. So if you don't have some certain vegetable or some certain ingredient, anything can be, um, you know, Supplement. Yeah, like you, you know, anything can be left out or added or whatever you want to do. I really want cooking. I want people to learn that cooking can be fun and it can be very spontaneous. And as long as you have vegetables around your house, we can always make something out of them. So I'm hoping you'll get some good skills out of those, those videos. So with that, let's get to the questions. Um, our first question, um, suggestions for getting zucchini to grow lately. I get a few and then the plant stops producing. Hmm, sounds familiar. We think <laughs> the flowers are not getting pollinated ideas. Yeah, that's that's generally what happens with squash. If you're not getting squash, that's usually uh, what is going on. And what, what one of the easiest things you can do is to actually plant flowers around your garden. So uh, there's, there's all kinds of beneficial mixes you can find uh, through seed companies and even you know, places like, I know Menards has a really good seed selection. I'd mentioned Ace Hardware, your local gardening stores, you can probably find a good pollinator mix is what they're called. And they're generally just uh, different types of flowers that will help attract pollinators into your area. And usually once they get into your area, uh, things like zucchini and squash plants are naturally very fragrant anyway. So they're gonna start drawing those insects to them as well. Yeah, planting flowers is an important part of in, within your garden for sure. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question. Um, can you suggest some varieties that I can start in the spring now? Um, I, I know I plant peas super early. As soon as the soil can be worked, I, I plant peas, um, like snow peas in the ground, and they grow amazingly in cold weather, but I'll let the experts answer. Yeah, so yep, so peas are good. Uh, things like, you know, lettuce you can do early, um, spinach, turnips, radishes, anything like that. Those are all quick growing. Uh, you may need to cover them probably with something early on to, uh, to help speed up. And so you can use, um, if you, uh, there's things like row cover or if you have a small area. Uh, so row cover is just a thin fabric that helps, that allows moisture and sunlight through, but it will, uh, keep things like insects and um, out, of, out of your area and also um, keep it a little bit warmer. You can also, you know, use like, a, if you have small pieces of, um, you know, like clear plastic or anything just to help keep it warm. But for the most part, any of those greens that I mentioned are, are really good to, to grow, to start early. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, our next question. Um, are there plants that grow better in greenhouses rather than direct sunlight and vice versa? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So in Michigan, I would say early on greenhouses are beneficial, uh, but otherwise there, there's really no point. I mean, you know, we're, when we farmed in Washington state, it was a lot cooler and we didn't get, you know, we had really cold, cold nights and it just never got that warm. I mean, we would, you know, if we got above 60 degrees at night, it was maybe four or five times the whole summer. Whereas here in Michigan, you're, you know, you can have, be above 60 or even up to 70 degrees, you know, a, a lot of the summer. So there's really, I don't think any benefit to growing anything in a greenhouse. And 
you know, uh, there's an argument that was that has been made in terms of uh, maybe disease pressure and insect pressure is less in a greenhouse. But I, I mean, honestly, if you have any type of high tunnel or greenhouse in the summer in Michigan, you're going to have that thing open anyway, or it's just going to end up cooking your plant. So um, I would say there's really, unless you're starting stuff really early, that's where there'd be a benefit to having a greenhouse or a high tunnel is getting early production and then also uh, doing it later in the year. So you'd, you'd have your stuff undercover in October and November to keep it warm. Okay, great advice. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions, but here's a comment. This was really interesting. It's making growing from seeds sound easier. Good. Yeah, that's good. Is that true? I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, you got it. So it's a kind of, uh, Deanna and Tom's uh, one of their, their brothers that uh, lives in Washington State. He's been a farmer forever, for 30 years probably. And we always used to joke around that uh, when we both were farming, well, he still is farming, but uh, that you could accidentally drop some seeds in the walkway and run over them with the tractor and, and you know, till them and everything else. And sure enough, two weeks later, those things would be, you know, uh, germinating through the ground. So it takes an awful lot to kill a plant. <laughs> and also if your seeds don't come up there's still time to get starters at the farmer's market yep, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and you can and you can go throughout the year too this isn't we kind of showed you there's some single things like tomatoes you know peppers cucumbers that you're going to plant once but a lot of these other things you can you know we grow we plant lettuce every two weeks you know you can those kind of things that you can you know carrots you can do uh, once a month you know those kind of things that are just you know will continue to grow we call them succession crops where you can grow those throughout the year yeah we seed lettuce every couple of weeks and we never run out of it through the summer like green onions lettuce stuff like that we just grow up like constantly okay okay good advice um next question are there any vegetables or herbs that i can that can be grown in the shade i do not get any sun in my area uh, I mean, like, you know, things that we've mentioned, I mean, lettuce, shade, lettuce will do okay in the shade and um, spinach, things like that. But for the most part, you want to get, you want to have yes. some type of sun, sunlight, even if you have an area where it gets a, a couple of hours, you know, a day, something at least where you could plant something out there. Cause it, you know, your plants need to photosynthesize. So uh, if they're in a completely shaded area, you know, um, you might want to try something like more of a perennial or a, a, um, a, some type of a plant or flowering thing that's, you know, obviously not an edible garden, but you could probably, you know, do Pretty something sure that's, flowers yeah, stuff, exactly, flowers or. That might be a really good opportunity to find out if your neighbors want to go into gardening with you. Yeah. <laughs> they may, maybe they've got a sunny spot. Maybe they spot. have a sunny spot and you can share the, share the community garden. Okay, that's a great idea. Yes, uh, doing it. Um, Gardening as a community is wonderful. Um, okay, two, a couple more questions and then we'll call it a night. Um, when is the best time of the day to water a garden? Uh, generally, I like to always water either first, first, well, I mean, if you can, first thing in the morning is best uh, just because it has time to absorb. And then, you know, sometimes water can be our, our enemy with plants if they are, if it's, especially if it's cool. And you've got any water at night or when the sun's going down because a lot of times those droplets can pick up bacteria and things and then they're sitting on your plants overnight it's rare but it can happen so for the most part i like to water first thing in the morning um, if it's really really warm it's also fine to water you know in the middle of the day is, is not a problem i generally don't like you know obviously things are out of your control if it rains there's nothing you can do about it but for the most part uh, I, I prefer watering in the morning okay wonderful um, two more questions. Um, okay, so this is to do with transplanting. Does the root ball of the transplants need to be loosened before putting into the main garden? Yeah, I, I'd say so. Uh, we it, it'd be worth checking out. And again, this is more advanced, but we use we do a, a method called soil blocking, where we actually it's a device that uh, has like a metal grid on it, and you actually um, punch it into the soil and it creates the soil blocks without any container so that your roots will air prune. But when we first started farming, we didn't have that option or what we weren't we using that option, it, we didn't yeah. know about it. So we were using plugs or trays. And generally what we would do is um, you wanna let the plants get as big as they can, you know, to allow them, you know, the best chance of surviving when you transplant them. 
but you also want to kind of watch them. So if they're starting to wrap around inside the, the, the yeah, they, it's called get, becoming root bound, bound and you'll see where all the roots will be <clears throat> kind of in a, um, you know, circular, uh, you know, around the actual outside of your, um, of your soil uh, plug. plug. <laughs> I don't use plugs anymore, so I was forgetting what those called. So the plugs, and so if that is the case, it is good to just kind of break them up a little bit. You want to make sure you don't rip the yeah. the um, roots. roots, but you do want to kind of break them up a little bit, and that will help lessen the transplant shock. Yeah, it is. I mean, you do have to keep an eye on those because when we did plugs, I mean, there was times if the weather was bad or we were busy or whatever, we couldn't get those things in the ground. And sometimes you'd go to pull them out and the roots were, I mean, they were so wrapped around there. They were coming out of the bottom of the tray. And I mean, those are, those are just too long. You really shouldn't be leaving them in there that long. They have to come out before that. Yeah. I mean, in a perfect world, the soil would always be the exact temperature that you want and you'd have the <laughs> right amount of moisture and you could direct seed. I mean, ideally sitting, putting a seed in the soil and letting it germinate and grow itself right from a seed is the best option. But uh, since we want to try and get stuff in the ground earlier and give it a head start, that's why we, we like to transplant. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. For our last question of the evening, could you please suggest some best places to get seeds? Yeah, yeah I mean, honestly, the so uh, Johnny's Seeds is a great place uh, that we, we buy most of our seeds from. But also just any of the places I mentioned earlier, we have, we live uh, right just outside of Chelsea and there's a farm and garden store where they sell seeds. All the Ace Hardware's right now, like I mentioned Menards, um, any garden center, uh, they're gonna have uh, more than enough seed. And in most cases, you know, they're gonna have a garden specialist there who might be able to direct you um, towards a certain type of seed that they grow themselves that does well in Michigan, or, you know, you may have some neighbors or family members who have grown a certain uh, seed variety that um, can also help you along with that. Uh, and it looks like Tom says maybe that you can get some free seeds at VegMish. <laughs> but we, if you do want to look at seed catalogs or order seeds, we do get seeds from, uh, it's called Johnny's Seeds, and they have a lot of really nice seeds there and different varieties of things.